never ever have enough time to play at all You know everybody wants to walk in someone else's shoes Everyone's forgotten Welcome again to Otter Creek in Rio Grande. So it's been almost a month or right at a month since I've done any kind of update. And if you'll recall in the last one, I, I mentioned I had lots of kind of little things that needed to be taken care of, you know, before I moved on to anything else. Because, you know, when you get finished with something and you can start running trains, it's real tempting to run trains and leave things maybe unfinished that should be finished. So I'm going to share a few of those things with you just uh, because you might be interested. Now, after I got Silver Gulch put up on the L girders, all of the wiring just draped through here and was a complete mess. So you can see I've gone in and tried to tidy things up as best I could. And somewhere I had uh, some pictures that I took before I started. If I didn't accidentally delete them, I'll, I'll show them. And it's, you know, nothing fantastic or anything, but uh, neatness and wiring counts in my book. And, and what was happening between here and the underneath side over there where my node panel is, it was, it was particularly offensive. So that's been taken care of. Now in a previous update, you'll remember that I, I ran all of this wiring and someone in a comment mentioned that it might be a bad idea to have the power running parallel with the DCC because there could be some interference. And, you know, I actually, I, I just did this today and I have had multiple operating sessions with all of that together, worse than it is now. And I didn't experience any abnormalities at all in, in the way the locomotives ran. But uh, just to be on the safe side, I did separate uh, DCC stuff, and I went ahead and, and lumped in the, the CAN bus for LCC in, in this top loom, and then my power is underneath. So that's taken care of. So this bus line and this bus line both had to be reconfigured. This one was probably 10 feet too long on that end underneath Silver Gulch. And then this one was probably three to five feet too long. And so I just, I cut them and, and put new ends on them, crimped on uh, new ethernet cable ends. And one of the things I learned in doing that is not all manufacturers use the same color codes. So <laughs> be sure and check the other end before you, before you do your crimping because your color code might not be the same. Uh, that, that's, I found out the hard way. I had to redo it, but it wasn't that big of a deal. So all of this area underneath the, uh, the silver gulch loop here, or the frying pan loop, I should say, all of that is about as tidy as I can get it. You know, these ribbon cables are just kind of what they are. They're not real easy to deal with, but I think it's going to be fine. Now, as you may recall, I did all of my wiring underneath frying pan and silver gulch both to include block detection. And I ran all of those wires as, as far as I could on the plywood underneath and then left a place where I could continue the wiring onto the block detection card. So that's another thing I've done. I've gone in and, and connected all of those that I could connect. And you can see I've got two of my blocks are currently occupied right now. Uh, that's all working. I've got 
uh, on this particular block detector, I've got the run up from Silver Gulch to Frying Pan is the first block. And then there's six other blocks in Frying Pan itself, including the Y track. So all, all that's taken care of. Another thing that, that really needed to be done is I needed to add more feeder drops for the run from the staging yard up to Silver Gulch. And I've, I've added three more. And so all that is working great the way I'd expect it to. Because uh, there was some wonkiness in how the circuit breakers were working prior to that. Now, all of my circuit breakers are are working exactly how they're supposed to. If I get a short circuit in staging, it doesn't affect the rest of the layout. Same thing with frying pan and silver gulch. Uh, no, no short circuits will, will shut down any location. There will be a little bit of modification to that, and, and I'll discuss that next. So here at Otter Creek and Rio Grande, I, I do try and show you my failures as well as my successes. And so this is the circuit breaker for Silver Gulch. This is the bus line shared with that circuit breaker that goes to all of the track from staging yard to Silver Gulch. It, it's, it's all on the same circuit breaker, which is, which is no big deal. The problem is the block detection. So here's what I did. Right here is the CT coil for that block, uh, which, which is all of the run up to Silver Gulch. And you can see that the wire to the CT coil runs from here to where the block occupancy detector is on the bottom of staging. Because I've got one block I'm making use of there and that block is, is in staging. So, if you know anything about block detection, which I did, <laughs> but it had been so long since I messed with it, I completely forgot. Your block occupancy detector has to monitor the track in the same circuitry that your CT coil is hooked up to. So, what I've got here is I've got the wire going to my CT coil is going to a block occupancy detector that is monitoring the DCC in staging. Uh, meanwhile, the actual DCC track wire, the bus wire, is over here, or was planned to be over here, or that, that's where the wiring going is coming out of the circuit breaker. So my CT coil can't pick up anything that's happening on this track. So uh, that was kind of a, a, a mistake, but I know what I'm gonna do to fix it, or at least my, what my plan is. So this bus line that's hooked is, is coming out of this circuit breaker, which is associated with Silver Gulch, that has to move. So all of the work that I did laying it off inside here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to pull it and instead take it back to my staging yard and then hook it up to the circuit breaker that the BOD, the block occupancy detector, is attached to so that it can monitor the DC signal effectively. So not that big of a deal, just kind of a, 
a pain in the butt that uh, I'm going to have to redo something I've already done. Another thing that I've gotten done is I've, I've added two more push buttons. So this button opens up the switch that goes into the RG mine and it only opens it up and it's open right now. So if I making use of the West yard, that's going to close that switch at the other end. And you know, no matter what I do now, that switch at the other end is going to stay turned that way. If I want to go into the mine, now I can go into the mine and then I've got a turnout that I've got the ore track and I've got an empty track. This push button is configured to alternate to either of those tracks. So that's taken care of. I've got just a few more things to do with the wiring before I think I'm ready to move on. And I've got two blocks in Silver Gulch. This main line and then what I kind of consider the passing siding that, that goes the high route through town. Those blocks are not hooked up yet. Uh, you can see I've got one of the wires there. It's just two blocks and they just need to run over here, but I don't have a block occupancy detector for it because when I originally did it, I thought I was gonna run those wires all the way down to the one on that end that has, you know, six open lines ready to be configured. I can't do that because there's no way that I can monitor the DCC here because all of the CT coils associated with, with those blocks are tidied up and nice and neat in there. So that's just not going to work. So I'm going to have to come up with a, a different way of doing it. Uh, here's another mess that is driving me crazy. That's really offensive, but I'm stubborn. Somewhere I've got the correct connectors for this. I can't find them. And so therefore I haven't been able to trim it and make it, you know, how I want it to work in there just because I haven't found the connectors, but eventually I will, or I'll buy some more and all of that garbage will be cleaned up. So where I'm at right now with the wiring, on this particular tower LCC, I've got six open lines that aren't being used. This is the, the line that's going to the two push buttons for the mine. And so I've got to figure out a way. I, I think it can be done. I might be confused, but where I can also make use of these lines for block occupancy as well as push buttons, I'm hoping I can do that. It's just a matter of, of getting the needed lines necessary out of the ribbon cable, some kind of breakout of the ribbon cable that allows me to, to use both push buttons and connect into a, a block occupancy detector. So I've got the detector, I just need to figure out how to go about doing that. And then uh, I'll be ready for implementation of a semaphore anywhere that, that I think I might need one. And, you know, if, if you've been watching the channel long enough, then <laughs> you've already figured out that the OC and RG is a, is a complete railroad of lies. Uh, there wouldn't have been semaphores at all probably associated with this. Uh, I think all of your Denver and Rio Grande narrow gauge never had any kind of electronic signaling at all. Uh, but I like the idea of semaphores, I, I just think they're cool. The only thing I might consider doing different than this would be, I wouldn't mind having a high ball, you know, a ball that rolls up and down on top of some kind of stand 
and I'm, I'm not looking for anything prototypical. All I'm really wanting is an indication that says the preceding block is currently occupied, don't go anywhere. Or, hey, there's nobody in the preceding block, uh, feel free to go if you want. That's really all I'm looking for is, is more of a, an automation thing that happens as a result of, of track being occupied more so than any kind of prototype. And, you know, my scenario for frying pan and this railroad is that it, it existed beyond when it would have existed anyway. So maybe they did implement semaphores. Now, if you've watched the last couple of videos, you know that I've been doing a lot of running trains and there's a dual purpose there. Uh, first, of course, because I deserve it and, and it's a lot of fun. And then the other part is I'm trying to find all the weaknesses in my rolling stock and any of the track work and take care of it now uh, because now's the time to do it in my opinion. So you may have noticed that this track is not painted and that's because I just went ahead and replaced the whole switch. Uh, I can't remember what exactly happened, but after I, I got this laid and before I painted the old one, I did something in here and just totally jacked it up and there just wasn't any fixing it. So I just created a new one. And so this, this is working fantastic. And so before the 482 and the 461 with the old turnout there, I could not operate at all in here. The Blackstones would work, but uh, my, my two brass locomotives, just no dice on this particular turnout. And now I can go frontwards and backwards anywhere in here. Now, one of the things that I figured out in, in really analyzing what was going on, uh, I, I figured out whenever you make one of these turnouts, if you watch the Fast Tracks videos, uh, he lays in a PCB tie and uses that as a guide to how much space that you should have on the rail that you solder that's not against the stock rail. Uh, and I never can remember whether it should be the straight rail or if it should be the diverging rail. Uh, what I figured out, particularly if you're coming out of a curve on any of these turnouts, you need a little more space in between the stock rail and the point rail at least on narrow gauge. I can't speak for standard gauge, but almost all of my derailments, I would say greater than 95% of them, they were happening as a result of too little space in here. And it was particularly bad on the brass locomotives and the rolling stock that had the wider uh, wheels, the wider wheel sets, the, the, the fatter, wheels. So I've gone through and as of right now, I don't believe I have any turnouts that this is the cause of a derailment. So, and there's been quite a few that I've adjusted the, the width or the, or the space between the stock rail and the point. All right, I did a lot of battling with this particular three-way. And what I found was that right here, I was having the same issue where there just wasn't enough space between the point and the stock rail as the wheel sets were coming through. The Blackstones were good 90% of the time. If you crawled through, you weren't gonna have any problems, but uh, again, my, my Fujiyama and my mountain models, I would derail almost every time. And so what I figured out is that 
I, I needed to move this in just a little bit. And in doing so, I had to remove a little bit of the base of the rail on the opposite side of this rail so that it could tuck underneath and come closer to this rail. And then once I did that, uh, I was having no more derailments right here. The other issues, you know, all surround this particular area of a three-way turnout, depending on which route you're going through, and the relationship between your guardrails and this point, this frog, and then this right here. And they're just a lot of trial and error, a lot of filing and, you know, kind of moving things around just a little bit, especially right here, because a flange has to be able to go through here. And if it's too close this way, you've got problems. If it's too far that way, then it, it jumps up on top of it and you get that body lift. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing that, you know, I'm not getting too many derailments or I wasn't getting too many derailments, but I was getting a lot of body lift because the wheels were hitting this and then, then making the decision to go to the direction that it needed to go and getting this little doohickus right here in the right spot and filed the right way so that it guides the flange this way when you're coming this way and or you're not crashing into this coming that way. It's uh, just just a lot of tweaking. And I think I've got them tweaked up enough where there's still gonna be a little bit of body lift uh, just because, and just in case there's somebody out there that is thinking about, you know, becoming a narrow gauger and, and looking at this and thinking, hey, that's something I wanna do. I, I just wanna be transparent in some of the things that you're gonna have to deal with. So as a wheel set comes through, when it gets to this point right here, it's gonna start pulling the wheel set to the right. And then when it gets here, it's gonna pull it to the right again. And then as it gets up here to this final guardrail, it pulls it again to the right. So you can see as this goes through, it changes directions one, two, and then a little slightly less, but a third time right there as it, as it travels through. And you can kind of see that first one's pretty abrupt. And you know, what I found is, is regardless of how well you check it with your, your NMR RA gauge, and, and you have to, you know, you have to have these flange ways uh, perfect and or a little sloppy. <clears throat> so how does that matter with your locomotives? And, and so here's what I'm gonna show you because this is kind of important, I think. So here is a West Side Models K37. And I want you to look at the side to side play of the wheel sets. So why that matters is that the distance from here where you're first starting to pull your wheel set that way and through here is, is less than the distance between the wheel set, uh, you know, from your first driver to your last driver. So you end up with a bind between those drivers in there because of a lack of side to side play which is why some of these tolerances need to be a little sloppier and you, you have to be careful because if you get them too sloppy, then that also causes problems. 
but that's why it's important. Now here is a K27 Blackstone. Look at all of that beautiful slop. So you can have this wheel set all the way over there and then this wheel set all the way over here and you've actually got a little bit of a radius built in. That's why these black stones uh, work so much smoother on those. And even, I mean, look at, look at that. How much room the trailing truck has to slide left and right. And even the front pilot truck is the same way. You've just got a lot of side to side play that if you've, if your track work is a little shoddy, this is going to work a lot better. So that's what I've been doing is really analyzing what's going on with the track, what's going on with the locomotives and, and trying to get everything running as smoothly as possible. So all that is to say that uh, I've really concentrated on doing what I can on the track work to make sure everything is working good. And so the last two or three operating sessions I've had, you know, the only derailments I'm getting right now, even with the 482, which is my most finicky locomotive, uh, is just 100% operator error because I thought something was thrown and it wasn't thrown and you know, the typical things that you do when you play with trains. So I'm gonna leave it there and hopefully I will get back to you, you know, before the end of May. Uh, you know, my work saga continues if, if you've been a subscriber for a while or been watching for a while, you'll know that about a year and a half ago, they closed down the facility that I was working at and I had to start working at a different location and I've been living away from home during the week. Well, they have now closed down that facility and I'm in the process of trying to find a new place to relocate to again and, you know, it's a bit frustrating, but uh, I'm going to keep driving forward with the railroad to the best of my ability uh, with the complications that, that I have. So stay tuned, and hopefully I will be back with uh, at least some videos of trains running. I can always do that. I'm just not sure what's going to take place with construction, with... Uh, scenery but uh stay tuned it's not over <laughs> lots of stuff to do thanks for watching guys yeah.